everybody that's speaking from experience. Uh, my name is Bob Block, and I'm the uh, director of BYO Biz, uh, mentor entrepreneurs on campus. And uh, we are the sponsor of this uh, Speaking from Experience series. Tonight, we have a co-sponsor, co which is the Stiller School of Business. And we have a great speaker. And I'm one of the lucky ones who I got to go to a little breakfast this morning and get a little preview of what Nadia is going to speak about. And it is fascinating. Uh, but before we begin, I have a couple of an commercial announcements to make. So bear with me. Uh, and this is mainly for the students. A um, couple things. October 27th, the afternoon, the internship uh, fair is going to go on in the gym. And uh, as all of you know, that's a great place. Uh, the Career Services packs a ton of great companies and organizations in there. Great place to go if you're looking for an internship or uh, just thinking about one down the road. November 10th, we are having a BYO Biz workshop at 3.30 in the afternoon. And this is a new thing we're doing. And the topic of this uh, is crowdsource funding. So if anybody's thinking about, gee, I'd love to get a Kickstarter going, or Indiegogo, or I've heard about this new Job Act, a Jobs Act that was passed about three years ago and is finally getting implemented, which uh, affects the way uh, startups can be funded. Come to this workshop. We have Karn Cross, who's a, uh, one of the founders of Fresh Tracks Capital. We have two students, uh, recent graduates of Champlain, who both have uh, uh, pulled off successful. Uh, one did an Indiegogo, and maybe he's on a second, and the other uh, uh, team did a successful, recently wrapped up a successful Kickstarter and launched their company. So it should be very good. And then finally, on November 11th, 7 o'clock in Perry, uh, Tuesday night, we have another speaker, and this one is Marguerite Dibble who I'm uh, proud to say is a very recent graduate of this institution. She graduated in 2012, and she has a fascinating company called Game Theory. Uh, they produce uh, games, as you can imagine, and they, uh, in addition to producing some successful games, are in a very interesting uh, deal working with uh, some Chinese investors and companies uh, to develop games for that market. So that should be fascinating. That's November 11th. So, but now we have the featured event, and I'm going to introduce Dr. Lindsey Godwin of the Stiller School, who will introduce uh, our speaker and her friend, yes. which is wonderful. I know. Thanks, Bob. Sure. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Yes, I'm Lindsey Godwin, associate professor in the Stiller School of Business. Thrilled to have you here. I know in our busy schedules, we're always trying to fit stuff in, but so thrilled to have you here. Um, to, yes, listen to uh, not just my colleague, but my dear friend, uh, Dr. Nadia jackson -Bila. People are like, how do you say that last name? And she'll say, it's just like it's spelled. Yes. <laughs> right? So don't ask her how <laughs> to say her last name. Um, and Nadia is um, an amazing person, an amazing intellect, um, and just doing amazing work around the world. I know you've read about uh, where she's from. She was the Coca-Cola Sustainability Chair, which she will tell you is a, sort of an oxymoron, Coca-Cola Sustainability mm -hmm. Chair at, um, in Bled in Slovenia, which is where she currently lives. Um, but she's done consulting with huge organizations all over the world. She's an executive in a mining company right now, which she can tell you more about. Um, but she is one of the reasons that I got into the field of looking at social responsibility, and some of you have even been in my class of corporate social responsibility, so you can thank her for getting me into this work in the first place. When we were doctoral students together in organizational behavior at Weatherhead, she's like, hey, we're starting this thing called business as agent of world benefit. What is that? I said, and I was curious enough, and she was smiling just like she was there, so she was hard to say no to. Um, and went and we've done amazing work together ever since looking at all the different ways that business and society intersect with one another and how can business truly be a force for social good and making money at the same time, which I know is of interest to many of you in this room. So with that, I turn it over to my colleague and my very dear friend, Nadia. So thank you for coming. 
I know it's evening and people are tired and it's been a long day and on and on and on. How are you doing? Good. Okay. So I did a little survey during the kind of schmoozing part of this thing of why you are here and there are different answers. Some are here because it's extracurricular and you get points and some are here because you're working with oceans and I promise you to say something about that and some of you are studying engineering an MBA or MBA first in engineering, trying to find some new ways of do business. And some of you I just met in a class previously and we went off different rails, so this was exciting enough to come back. So my hope is that for about 20, 30 minutes I can make it interesting for you or not and you will start walking out of here. <laughs> and um, after that we can have a conversation. Is that okay? Can okay. You can, you can you hear me? Yeah, all good. So I need to tell you how this thing came about and the first thing I have to say that there is not going to be a conversation about fish. Um, there will be a conversation about fish as a metaphor, but there are a few people who approach me like I'm doing this great conservation work and I love and adore that work. This is not what's going to happen here. So this is not a story about fish. Then the question is what is this story about? So as Lindsay says, I am a recovering academic. Uh, the way alcoholics are recovering alcoholics, I am definitely a recovering academic. I love academia very much so and I'm sure I will come back into it with a different relationship to this world. But what happened to me is that for a few years, quite a lot of years, 2001, so 13 years, I've been connected academically to the field of sustainability. And there are a lot of things that happen in that field that I contributed to and felt, I thought, for very good reasons, very proud of. Until three years ago, I was asked to help a business. And I helped many businesses before in this field. Uh, my first project actually happened right here. I helped put together the first uh, work on the push to and sustainability for Green Mountain Coffee Roasters. So I was here 2000, in 2003, putting up a few hundred people summit and running it. So I feel like there's something to be proud of, but then something happened. So a few years ago, three years ago, I'm asked by one of the largest mining companies in the world to help them survive. The company was public by that time for quite a few years, and it was dying. And it was dying because, as you know, the public businesses are run as quarter-to-quarter -quarter survival, so every quarter <coughs> you need to do the best you can to meet the expectations of the market. And if you don't, the market publish, punishes you quite heavily. And this company that listed in London in 2007 very beautifully was almost killed by the market and the way the uh, public space demands the company to maximize profit immediately rather than think about long-term survival. So I thought, yes, I know something about survival, and this is supposed to be my title, sustainability, ability to be there. So how about I come and help? And um, a tender spot in my space is that originally it was a Kazakh company, where I'm from. So uh, only two companies from Kazakhstan ever listed in London Stock Exchange. This was a kind of pride and joy, 10% of the country GDP, a huge amount of the population depends on this country, and it can die any minute. So I, I'm coming there, I tell the story everywhere, a few of you already heard it, I come there as this fancy as I felt. This person who can impair wisdom, who can save this company, and I have this beautiful title, and I fly to one of the first places I visited within this mining site, which is a ferrochrome uh, plant, a place where um, iron, iron ore, is mixed with chrome, to become ferrochrome so that you can get that stainless steel that I'm sure you all enjoy. So we are the largest producer of uh, ferrochrome and I guarantee you are touching our products on a weekly basis. So I come in, it's February, it's minus 43 Celsius, which is like minus 30 Fahrenheit. It's a huge amount of wind and snow everywhere. And the plant, which is on a huge, huge manufacturing site, the plant has no walls. It never had walls. It was built right after Second World War. It has posts and a roof, no walls. And that was one of the most humbling experiences I had in business because this is not a tiny little shack operation. 
This is one of the best mining companies in the world, one of the largest, and it has no walls. So anything beautiful thing, I can tell it about saving the whales and the monkeys and whoever else I need to save. These people are operating in minus 30 with open air. So it was extremely sobering and extremely real. And my feeling was that whatever we've done in sustainability is nowhere close to the challenges the walls and the businesses of our life face. That we need to figure out a way, if I was proud of what we've done to that, that point, I felt like we've done almost nothing if we still are in a business with no walls. We need to accelerate and we need to come up with tools and solutions that not only work better, but also are much more exciting, much more appealing, much more beautiful, much more. So uh, why appealing and exciting? Sustainability. What comes to my, your mind when you hear the word sustainability? This is not a rhetorical question, so literally, what comes to your mind? You hear the word sustainability, first image that comes to your mind. Status quo, Sta recycling. Mm -hmm. Ben and Jerry's, yeah, sure, I hope so. Being in Vermont, being in Burlington, this is a place. Green, Re regenerative. Yeah, something that regenerates, yeah? What else? What comes to mind when you hear the word sustainability? Keep something from dying, it's there, yeah? Is it something that excites you? Yeah? Is it something that you, I want to be there? This is the world I want to be. Yeah? Okay, so let me test that assumption in a different way. So imagine that um, after this talk, you go and have a great dinner. Yeah? There's some great places here in Burlington. So you have a great dinner. And as you're walking out of a restaurant, you bump into an old neighbor of yours. You haven't seen each other for a few years, but you used to be close. You know, you had barbecues and other things. And you were hugging and how's life, how's things are going, how's work, how's your marriage? Sustainable? Is that the aspirational feeling? Is that the best you want to feel? Yeah. So we come to the storyline that sustainable is something amazing. I don't know how we got to that point. But if you abstract from everything we heard in media, what sustainable is, and just ask ourselves, are we excited by this word? Do we want our marriages to be just sustainable? Do we want our businesses to be just sustainable? Do we want our world, our societies, our economies to be just sustainable? And is that enough? And the question for me as I was looking at um, all these businesses is, uh, then how do we know that's enough? What is that that is going on in the world that we are not getting with our existing models of sustainability that we are not addressing? Is there something fundamental that the business at least needs to understand and what's happening in the world? And the simplest way I could kind of simplify it for my mining company or for any other business is this. So if you think about our global economy, this is the picture of our global economy. Our global economy, you can immediately see, is linear. Linear means that we get something out of one place, usually out of a mountain or land of some sort, whether it's agriculture, mining, fishing. And then we process it usually only once, and then it ends up in the trash within 12 months. Now, percentage-wise, I asked the class today, so you cannot speak, but percentage-wise, how much do you think in percentage of everything we get out of our earth ends up in the trash within 12 months? How much? 60, uh-huh, that's a good guess. Anybody else? 80%. 80? 95? You guys are very optimistic. So the number is somewhere around 99 and up. Absolute majority of everything we get out of the earth within 12 months ends up in the trash. Now, if you think about our economy, it's remarkable that we find it as okay to get something like oil out of your earth and then process, refine it, uh, petrochemical it, and on and on and on to produce a plastic fork that we trash within 12 months. But that's our economy. That's the way we conceived the economy. And the remarkable thing that we as businesses don't recognize fully, and sustainability movement is not helping us, is the fact that we are running out of things to mine and we are running out of the places to trash. 
That realization, the collapse of linear economy where we have nothing else to mine and very little left to trash is not a story that business understands or wants to engage in. And our green movement and sustainability movement is not helping. Actually, our green movement has been telling the same story for quite some time and business grew tired. They keep telling me, 40 years ago you told us we have 40 years of oil left, and 30 years ago you were telling us that there's 40 years of oil left, and 20 years ago it was 40 years, of, and today is 40 years of oil. We are not believing this. But there is actual objectivity in what business is saying, because for most of 20th century we actually lived in an absolute macroeconomic miracle. And what I mean by that? 20th century, throughout the entire 20th century, if you look at our commodity prices, the prices of our raw materials and what they're doing through the centuries, you will see that they, of course, not uh, a, a, a line. It's a, a, a bit of a kind of jaded line. We had peaks and valleys, but the trend is absolutely a reduction of price. So in real terms, adjusted for inflation, our raw material prices over one century fell by almost two times. Now, you can say this is okay, yeah? with the exception that it doesn't make any sense from macroeconomics. So when do the resource prices fall in macroeconomics? On the market, when the prices start falling? When there's too much supply, yeah, when there's not too much demand and there's too much supply. But the reality is that in the same time, the same century, our population quadrupled, our economic output increased 20-fold, 20 times, and the demand for supply went up by 600 to 2,000%. So we lived in an absolute macroeconomic miracle where the demand on raw materials was growing, but the price were falling. It was a geopolitical situation where more and more so-called banana republics were entering the market. So, for example, when my country, Kazakhstan, became independent, being an... Um, dictatorship, if you will. We have the same president for 25 years. Being a dictatorship, the government just released all of its resources to the market severely underpriced. And that <coughs> happened to pretty much every republic that went independent throughout 20th century. Because the, usually it's not a democracy, it's a dictatorship um, government that just releases the resource severely underpriced. So the resource price kept falling and falling and falling. But this is not a reflection of where our economy is. The reflection of our economy is that we are finally catching up with macroeconomic miracle, meaning that the market is beginning to adjust itself. So already just the first 10 years of the 21st century, the raw material prices shoot up. And our projection is that they will be going up and up and up and up. We are finally correcting the mistake. Because we cannot live in a world where there are more of us and we are consuming more. And there is the same amount of molecules on this planet. Even if we find more, it's just this amount of molecules. And pretend that we can use them indefinitely. The linear economy is under severe collapse. Now most of us, when we hear the story, we hear the story of oil and all other resources that at least make it into public domain, right? So oil makes it into public domain, few others, gold makes it into public domain. But there are many resources that never make it to public domain. For example, food. Anyone here doesn't eat? No? Everyone some good cheese? There's some good cheese there, really. So if all of you are eating, this is information that would be uh, very important for you. So. Often when we talk about food and resource, we speak about tonnage, right, the volume. What we don't speak about is chemical <coughs> composition of our food. And if we look at the actual data on what our food constitutes, we are losing nutrition value of our food across the board each year. So in the last 20 years, on average, across 43 garden crops, we lost 6% of protein, 16% of calcium, riboflavin, which is a nutrient without which a baby's brain cannot develop during pregnancy. We lost 38% of all riboflavin from our food. Now, when you look at this, you can say this is a humanitarian problem. We need to save the world. We need to save the planet. When you're a businessman and you look at it, this is a strategy problem. This is not a humanitarian problem. If you're producing food or if you are employing people, anybody here in business who doesn't employ people, just does it with zero people, if you are in any way dependent on the health and vitality of people, this is a strategy problem. 
It's a problem of how we're going to continue if we're in food operations, how we're going to continue if we have employees who have nothing nutritious left to live. This is a strategy problem. Now, same with species. So in the 19th century, we are losing one species per year. In 1975, we started losing about 1,000 species per year. By 2000, we started losing about 40,000 species per year. And this is where fish finally comes into conversation. So yes, we are projecting that there will be absolutely no open ocean commercial fishing beyond this century, the mid of the century, 2048 is approximate uh, measure. But you look at this and say, again, this is a humanitarian problem. Yes, it is. But for a business, this is a strategy problem. So I was with a very big bank in Europe three weeks ago. Erste Bank is one of the largest banks in Europe. And I'm sitting there with executives of the bank and say, okay, so what does the loss of species mean to your business? Let's take one species, bees. What does the loss of bees mean to your bank? And they never ask themselves that question. They're bankers. This is not what they're supposed to do. When we start mapping out their value chain, it shows that their portfolio is at least 50%, not 100, at least 50% directly dependent on agriculture. And if you have no bees, you have no cross-pollination. If you have no cross-pollination, you have no crops. They can put half of their portfolio into high risk if the bees disappear. They, they will have no returns on those loans because all of their agriculture services, all their agriculture customers will die. So this is a strategy problem. This is not only a humanitarian problem. And it's not just, of course, the resources on the left side, or for you it's the, yeah, the left side of the linear economy. It's also the right side, the trash. So UK is announcing it has run out of the places to trash. And you can say, well, UK is the oldest economy in the world. It had 200 plus years to trash everything it could trash. No, nope. the newest economies like the um, Middle East, Dubai, for example, recently announced it has no more places to trash. We've trashed everything we can possibly trash. Again, you can say this is a humanitarian problem. When we have six times more plastic in the sea than plankton, and this is what scientists tell us about ocean gyre, six times more plastic than plankton, you can say, oh my God, we've killed the planet. The planet is alive and well. It's a different planet, but it's alive and well. For a business, this is a strategy problem. How do we mine the oceans instead of mining the earth? If so much petroleum is floating in our oceans, this is a business problem. Now, the question for most businesses, of course, when they look at all of this and say, okay, this is all very, very heavy, doom and gloom, Armageddon is here, bees are dying, fish is dying, the whole thing is horrible, what do I do about that? How do I understand that? It's really three things that matter to businesses when it comes to creation of value. One is declining resources. So how do I manage the resource decline? How do I prepare myself for the rapid changes in the pricing? And of course, when the resource is declining, it's not immediate and predictable, it's not linear. It's actually very jaded in the sense of what's happening with oil prices, right? They go up to 140 and then they fall down to 80 and then they go up again and, and it's a kind of roller coaster. So if you're producing this chair, yeah, your company producing this chair, what does oil pricing mean for you? What does it mean? Yeah, number one is transportation. So how do you price yourself if it can change not by 10%, like what happened now, we just had oil prices of about 120 and we're just approaching 80. That's a huge difference. That's not just, you know, 5% increase and decrease. Let's say you are sure that oil prices are increasing. They go from 100 to 110, from 110 to 120 for barrel. What can you do as business to manage that? Just think, what can you do? Cut your use. Cut your use, that's one, so reduce. What else? Charge Say it again. Charge more. Charge more for the chair, and that is an interesting option uh, for a market that keeps asking you to for less and less and less, so lower on prices, yes? So you pass on the difference on the consumer. What else? Yeah, so you would 
break up the economy of scale and make it a small production with localized communities, yeah. What else? Make something else. Make something else, yeah. And that is a very real option, right? So if you are in the business of chairs, what are you actually selling? Sitting, right. You're not selling chairs, you're selling sitting. And there are many, many different ways to deliver sitting. So there are alternatives, but what business goes with, the majority of business, it doesn't go in all of these creative questions. It says, okay, are there are simple cost movement issues? Should we pass it on to a consumer? Or should we fire quite a few people? The number one response in business stuff so far was headcount. Let's just fire some people and that's where we're done, we're good. And second, in, can we use financial instruments like hedging, right? Can we pay if it's at 110? Can we buy it at 100 for a very big amount for the next three years? And let's say you are the smart guy and you are hedging at 110 and then the oil crashes to 80 as it did now. What happens to you then? You're again screwed. So the question is not whether you adjust to the better roller coaster. So the roller coaster of pricing, you bring, build a better car to deal with the roller coaster. It's not that. It's how do you get off the roller coaster altogether? I love this quote but by one of the senior officials of OPEC. He was at that point oil minister of Saudi Arabia. And he was asked, when will we see the end of the age of oil? When will we see the end of the age of oil? And he's a minister of oil in Saudi Arabia. What do you think was the answer? So the first reaction is never. For a country that is 100% dependent on oil, you would think that they want to keep it in perpetual thing. Any other guesses? It's already over. It's already over. So that's doom and gloom story. Yes, possibly. He said something that was really, really beautiful and I think the most meaningful in this work. He said, <clears throat> when he was asked this question, he actually said a very simple thing. The Stone Age did not finish because we ran out of stone. The Stone Age did not finish because we ran out of stone. So it's not an invitation to create a better roller coaster. It's the idea to get off the roller coaster before it's too late. So how do we do that? If we are a business and we're dealing with those declining resources and increasing expectations, what are we supposed to do? What do you think business does when they learn that the resources are dying, the expectations are increasing, the population is growing, the Armageddon, the bees? What are they doing? You work with businesses or you work in businesses. What are you doing? You have a summit to say, okay, how will survive? Yes, that works. You see, absolutely. That's very few progressive companies. Before those progressive companies, what are you doing usually? The companies you know, what are they doing? The yeah, they engineer something else. What do you think is the number one strategic response to the collapse of linear economy so far? Declining resources, running out of trash space, increasing expectation. Number one strategic response. Buy another company. Yeah, yeah, so let's buy something else. I wish it was. It's not even this progressive, yes. Yes, number one strategic response, you're absolutely right, is to do nothing. Number one strategic response we so found so far is to look at this question as a trade-off. Either we make money or we address this. And since we need to make money in the now, we just cut this as something that is irrelevant. The number one response is to do absolutely nothing. An absolute majority of businesses that I've been tracking do absolutely nothing. They have to do something because Media pressures them, customers pressures them, nonprofits pressure them. So they do these things and they put these labels we designed with very good intentions. In um, very often academia called corporate social responsibility and citizenship. And don't get me wrong, there are, there are companies that do it beautiful and they mean it. Unfortunately, absolute majority of businesses are not that. Absolute majority of businesses spend 5,000 on this and 25,000 on PR to PR that. So 5,000 goes to orphanages, 25,000 to PR that we just gave 5,000 to an orphanage. And that, of course, is not helping anyone. Then there are companies who say, well, we need to do one thing, right? So how about we have one product that is unique and that really works out? Or we have normal yogurt and one organic yogurt, normal cars and one eco car, normal, yeah? 
And this would be what the category of bolt-on sustainability. And then, of course, there are companies that are doing something much deeper, embedding sustainability into the very DNA of the business. And in that sense, integrating, bless you, integrating it deeply into company. And when I was working uh, before the mining story and I looked at this progression, I thought, this is great. We're making progress, right? This is nothing. This is something. This is a lot, whole lot of something. And I thought, we, you know, we got it. It's all great. And then a little trouble came about, which is what's happening with the consumer with this story? How is the consumer perceiving green? So when I say green product, what comes to your mind? Say it again. Biodegradable, yes. Uses less resources. Uses less resources, yes. Organic. Organic of some sort, yes. Renewable. Renewable, uh-huh. Expensive. Expensive. Can I check that assumption? For all of your organic, renewable, biodegradable, is it usually more or less expensive than the traditional counterpart? More. More expensive. Now, how about beauty? Is it as beautiful, as well designed as the traditional counterpart? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. It depends on the product. If we average it out to statistical average, majority of customers would, would say no. It's not that it's objective truth. It's the perception of the consumer. Now, how about performance? Is the biodegradable organic shoe is as good as the you know, research Nike knit? Yeah, most people will perceive absolutely not. So then in the eye of the average consumer, green means ugly, underperforming, and overexpensive. No wonder nobody wants to buy it, for God's sake. Who would? In their run mind. So here's a product that came out in 2012. As you can see, it's beautifully ugly, overpriced, and underperforming. It is possibly the shoe or the state shoe of the month. The problem is that customers cannot believe in this. They cannot be tricked this way. An idea that you can offer them one thing, whatever it is, organic, green, eco, and take away a whole bunch of other things is a business well, crime, if you will. You have to, value is about creating something that's actually better, stronger, more interesting, not taking things away for this one label. So we see that absolutely with the statistics that yes, do customers demand and um, declare that they will buy this product. They say, we will buy this product. Actually, an average of 40% of customers say, we will buy green products. We are ready to pay extra price. You follow them into the store, no more than 12% buys. The customers are smarter than ugly, underperforming, overpriced products. And they have all the rights to be. So the question for me when the overfished ocean strategy thinking came about is, is there an alternative? Is there an alternative to ugly, overpriced, underperforming? Or this is it. Is there an alternative to linear economy or is it it? And is there a way that we can make it something that is relevant and exciting, interesting for mainstream miners, not only the conscious progressive Vermonters, which is a tiny, tiny percentage of the world. So how can we make it relevant and interesting for everyone? So here's a few stories that got my attention. When I got the sense that something new is going on, this are just a few small seeds. None of them is breakthrough. None of them are kind of amazing, save the world, praise the Lord. But they're small. So here's the first one of them. Puma asks itself a very simple question. Why do we spend a huge amount of money on these big boxes that are very hard to assemble, ship them all the way from China, then in the store put them in a separate bag where the customer comes home and trashes box and the bag in the first two minutes of arriving home? And we're paying for that. Where is intelligence in that? And of course it's easy to say, okay, let's not do that. Let's do biodegradable boxes and pass on the price to the customers, but the customers are not gonna buy that. So for Puma, it was a question, is there an alternative? And here's what they did. Thank you, Bob.
So I'll stop it here. What you will notice immediately, this is a solution that actually brings extra value for everyone. So for the customer, it's very simple. This is a reusable bag, something that they can travel with or send their kids with to school. This is something that doesn't require separate bag and separate box. For the company, it's much cheaper to produce this and much cheaper to ship. It's a huge decrease of input on the environment in terms of use of water, electricity, CO2 emissions and everything you can imagine. It costs much less. So in every way, ugly, overpriced, underperforming, it's actually the other way around. It's performing better than traditional package. It's more beautiful than traditional package in terms of marketing the story of the company, the way the company wants to position itself and it's much cheaper to do. Now, notice they didn't call it eco bag. It's not green bag. It's not sustainable back. There's a reflection of what the market being tired of that idea. They want just basic common sense, basic smartness. And when the customers were actually asked, what's your reaction? Their first reaction well, was, well, if the box is so intelligent, imagine what's inside. So it is about positioning your company for something different. But Puma is not alone. So. Not only Puma is doing that, there are quite a lot of companies that are now looking at this alternative way. So in addition to Puma, uh, new solutions coming up. For example, in Chile right now, there is a solution that allows, because of high humidity, to actually capture clean and purify water out of thin air. This is a billboard. The billboard is taking space and energy and resource. So if it's standing there, can we use billboards to capture water out of thin air and purify it on site and provide that air, uh, provide that water for people who need it? Microsoft, anybody heard of this company? Yeah, okay. Familiar with that one? Now, what does Microsoft produce? How does Microsoft make its money? This business technological solutions. Business technological solutions, yes. In the past it was software. Today when software is given away by free, for free by people like Apple, company needs to go somewhere else. Where do you think is one of the hottest areas for Microsoft to go? Services. Absolutely, cloud computing <coughs> services. Cloud computing is the number one solution. Now, when you think about resource depletion, what is the number one issue with cloud computing? Air conditioning. Air conditioning, absolutely. You first use electricity to power up the data service, so it does data intelligence, but then you need to cool it down. And data is an interesting thing. If you think about data service, and you are seven years old, and you walk into the room and you see a data server, what do you see? Just describe for me. Just describe. You're a seven-year-old, you walk into the room, and you see a data server. You walk right by. You would walk right, right by. It's a box. Anything interesting about the box? Blinking lights. Blinking lights, yeah. Anything else? Yeah, it's warm. So if you think about a warm box, for Microsoft that was a light bulb. Well, we're actually talking about furnaces. That's what furnace is. It's a hot box. So today, Microsoft already researched and put out a paper on turning their data service into distributed data furnaces, which means that they will position their service in residential houses where people get a benefit because they don't need to buy a furnace. Microsoft gets a benefit because they do not need to pay for the electricity to run the data servers. They're figuring out the security of how they would protect the data. But it is not inconceivable to think about that. Yes? I just have to do a slight Champlain pat on the back because actually in our Lakeside building, our server, which is hosted at that building, helps keep the Lakeside building. So, so something our HF Yeah, is you see? Like, this, this yeah, this is not a crazy future. This is happening today. And it's a different idea, different relationship to resources and different relationship to our, um, to our processes and business solution. Now, uh, Flow2, anybody heard of this company? No? Flow2 is a European startup. It's about two years old. It's active in about four countries. And their question was very simple. Why do we as businesses invest so much in capacity and then underuse it? If you think about this room, how often do we use this room? Is it booked 100% of capacity? If you think about this projector, is it booked for 100% of capacity? So how do we create an easy business solution that allows anybody to rent an extra capacity? So Flow2 is a kind of Airbnb, but just for business, 
where you have unused capacity, let's say this one is not used two days a week, you can rent it, it's insured, and anyone in the area, you cannot rent it to Californians, it's not worth for them to fly here. But that's an extra benefit, right? There's a local resilience because then you will share res resources between businesses and you make money on it. The company flow too makes money on it. The actual businesses that are renting their unused capacity is making money on it. And we are much more resource intelligent in that way. Now, throw and grow confetti. Any of you heard of that one? No? Now, if you think about the value of confetti, if you ever use confetti at a party, how long does the value of confetti last? Two seconds, yeah, as far as it goes up and go down. But we have to grow trees for a few decades, cut down the tree, process the tree, ship the tree for two seconds of value. How stupid is that? So Throw and Grow Confetti decided that it will never sell confetti again. What it sells is flower seeds in the form of a confetti. So you throw the confetti, when it falls on the ground, you scoop it up, you put it in the, ground, in the soil and then Flowers are out in a few days. It's in a question of how can we build layers of value in everything we create and squeeze additional resource intelligence of everything we do. So different companies call this approach different things. They do not call it sustainable. They do not call it eco. They do not call it green. So the name is really up to your culture, up to your solution. For the company that I chair uh, board for, uh, it's oil and uh, gas company, OMV, for them, they decided that the name that resonates with their culture and their industry is resourcefulness, so they call it a resourcefulness strategy. Um, a company that just does, deals with consumer trend watching, trendwatching.com, one of the best consumer watch groups, they call this eco-superior strategy. A hotel chain called Design Hotels, global 200 chain hotels around the world, call it infinity strategy. These are the words that for them excites their imagination and seem impossible. The umbrella term for me so far is overfished ocean strategy, which is about how do we take resource depletion and turn it into something miraculous, something amazing. Now, why overfished ocean? Most of you who are in strategy will immediately guess that it has something to do with blue ocean strategy. Majority of people have no clue what this means, so I have to say, uh, and they shouldn't. This is a jargon term in a very narrow place. So how do strategists think about strategists? Well, strategists think about strategy in terms of two options, the red ocean or the blue ocean. Red ocean is an existing market. So imagine that you, uh, let's say, are producing chairs. Yeah? And if you'd like to be very unique and distinctive on the chairs, you would look at around who is already producing chairs. Out of them, you would map out the existing market. Some of them are competing through price, right? They're selling the cheapest play chairs around. That's how they survive the competition. Some of them are competing through uniqueness. Remember Herman Miller, iconic chairs? Those are not cheap chairs, but they are definitely distinct. Some, some people compete on that. But whether you compete on uh, cost or differentiation, within, within the established market, Usually it's a kind of doggy dog, so the big fish, it's the small fish and the blood is spilled all over. That's why it's called red ocean, because everyone is killing everyone else. An alternative to red ocean, the idea that you can create new uncontested market space, the blue ocean. Cirque du Soleil is the most famous story here. So instead of competing with the existing circuses, which is, we were laughing with the class, it's usually some kind of brothers. I don't know why it's always, not, never sisters, never parents, it's some Wrigley brothers. Yeah? Instead of competing with a typical circus on bringing more unique animals or cutting the price, what Cirque du Soleil said is actually we're going to create circus for adults. that never been done before and nobody's competing there. So that's the blue ocean, that's the difference between red and blue ocean. And when I looked at what's going on with our linear economy, it was very clear that whether it's red ocean, blue ocean or rainbow ocean, if you have no resources left, it doesn't matter. So we have to learn how to turn depletion of resources into competitive advantage. And just to come to a close here, I have a few tests for you. So for those of you who already seen it in different color, you cannot answer. But for the rest of you, this is the best example of overfished ocean strategy that I discovered. So what is this? Soap. Soap. Good guess, but it's not. 
sponge of some sort. Excellent guess, but it's not. Grass, some sort of condensed, well, that could be, but it's not. What could it be? It's a product you use today or yesterday. Mm -hmm. Why shampoo? Why shampoo? <laughs> what about this? What about this scream shampoo at you? Not like I've just seen something like it before, like usable, reusable dry shampoo. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In front of you is not one, not two, but three bottles of shampoo. Now, how did this idea come about? It's a very simple question. What do we sell when we sell shampoo? What's the end benefit? What's the value? Clean hair, yeah? So when we sell clean hair, what is the ingredient that is always available on site and therefore is completely unnecessary? Water. Water. We cannot use shampoo without water. So why do we then pump water, process water, bottle water, ship water, store water, bless you, when water is completely unnecessary? Why do we do that? That was the question behind this product, which is, can we create an alternative that is as good or better, that is actually cost more, less, yeah? value more, cost less, more user-friendly, more unique, and create an interesting market advantage. This is a private company, so they don't speak about all the money they save all together, but they did release the information that just transportation cost savings is 15 times. It's 15 times less to ship this version per wash than it is the traditional liquid shampoo. So this is huge financial success. Now, one more test. What is this? This is a bad picture. This is the best as I can. But what is this? If it was here, it would be exercise size, exercise ball, and it would have a handle that can undo and a little opening right here. So what do you think this is? Composter. Compost of some sort. Yay. Will barrel of something. Good idea, but it's not. Treadmill. <laughs> How do you use it? A kind of balancing thing. Yeah, we're going out on a limb here. Yes, it could be, but it's not. What could it be? Anything, anything, anything? Any wild guesses? Just go out of it. A yo-yo. A yo-yo, very massive, humongous exercise ball size yo-yo in front of you is a washing machine. Now, this is a washing machine that is created for a tiny, tiny market of about 5 billion people. <laughs> because that is the market that involves people who actually need to walk to water supply and back on average six hours a day. So most of the developing world does not have a water supply. It needs to physically walk there. And most of the time in our media, we present them as this beautiful, exotic women with this beautiful, exotic things on their head. This is actually very dangerous very bad for the development. Usually it's the girls who do that and there's no alternative for them. This product allows you to roll this thing instead of carrying on yourself. It creates many other values. It has ribbed insides and outside the way, remember our grandmothers used to have this metal thing that is ribbed? The way we clean for actually hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, children can play with it. It has many different values. It's a great water container and it's extremely cheap to produce, requires no electricity, requires no moving parts. This is way beyond sustainability. This is an amazing new line of products. So when I started looking at what makes it tick, well, how do you create this kind of products? Which principles would you apply? So far I found only five. I will only speak about one and then we will close because I know I'm already way over the time. But I will speak about only the first principle and then um, I will give you a whole bunch of resources that you can get and download and watch videos and everything else so you don't need to sit here with me to do that. So the first principle is as simple as it comes. It's not new. It's been around for billions of years. Our linear economy is an economy of only a few hundred years. But for billions of years, this earth has been working with a circular economy. Economy is how do we generate prosperity, right? How do we generate more? How do we create more? And nature has done it for billions of years. Nature doesn't have waste. When I die, my body is not waste. It's food for a whole bunch of excited millions of microorganisms that eat my body. And that becomes soil, and soil becomes tomato, and tomato becomes something else. It's a true circular economy. So there's no such way as things waste in nature. 
waste equals food. Now, we as humans, of course, cannot create only the biological metabolism. We manipulate the chemicals to the point where they cannot be digested by nature anymore. It doesn't know what to do with plastic. It takes it thousands of years to figure out what to do with plastic. So we need the biological metabolism and the technological metabolism. And the best company I know that does it well is Shaw Industries, where the carpets that Shaw Industries, any of you heard of Shaw Industries? Yeah? So the carpet manufacturer, instead of taking the carpet, the commercial carpet manufacturer, so big hotels, for example, would have show. Instead of taking this carpet at the end of a life and send it to the landfill today, Shaw developed a backing that is non-PVC, reusable uh, to parts per million backing. So today it takes about two hours to get from an old carpet to new raw materials. And the company doesn't need to pay for new raw materials. This is extremely efficient for them. So instead of constantly paying for new raw materials, they just keep using the same and the same and the same. It's also very easy for the customers. It's a 1-800 number on the back of the carpet. So when you're done, you just call it and the company comes and picks it up for free. Now, why would the customer do this? What's the benefit? What's the value to the customer? Yes. Absolutely, because it's extremely expensive to pay for disposal. If you're a hotel and you need to dispose all of your carpet, that's a whole bunch of money. So when you have a 1-800 number, that's a very easy solution. Extra value for the customer, extra value for the company. So we're seeing more and more of this kind of thinking coming along. And of course, you start with very small steps. So the final story of today, I told it in class already, so I apologize for the repeat. How many of you heard of company ReCapture? Yeah, what does ReCapture do? Absolutely. So you would see this kind of screen and you would have two words there and you type in them in to see that you're really not a robot. Yeah, this is very important, useful product, right? We need that because otherwise we are constantly bombarded by more and more spam, more and more other type of things. So this is a protective mechanism for us. If you were to guess how many millions of people are using, have to do this at least once a week, every week. How often do you do this? More than once a week, right? So if you think about millions of people doing it around the world, how many seconds do you think it takes you to do that? Yeah, a few seconds. Let's say five, four seconds, but it's 100 million people every week. Multiply those seconds in terms of labor, multiply it in terms of electricity. That is huge investment of energy, right? Energy resource of every kind. So what ReCAPTCHA created, actually originally it was just called CAPTCHA, and ReCAPTCHA said, well, if we're wasting these hundreds of millions of minutes every week, how about we do something useful with that? So today, every time you're doing ReCAPTCHA, you're actually digitizing old books. Because every time you will get ReCAPTCHA window, you will get one, win one word that comes from an old book, from a picture of the book, and one generic word that is automatically generated. And if you type this one right, the system assumes that you type the second one right as well. It verifies it against 10 or 15 other people to minimize the probability that you all got it wrong. And here you go. You just digitize the book. Yeah. And the amazing thing is that just it's a basic resource intelligence. It's how do we take what we're wasting anyway and reuse it? Thousands and thousands of books have been digitized. This company was sold very happily to Google Books. And today, that's the work you're doing. You're digitizing old books. If you were a traditional company, what you would do, you would hire thousands of people, put them in the very expensive buildings, give them thousands of computers, and they would sit and digitize books. Why do that if we can do something more exciting? And the second invention, it's by the same guy, Louis von An. His next company is called Duolingo, which is a gaming technology for learning languages, especially for developing the world. It's a free app, so anyone around the world can download it and learn a language. I actually learned it with my daughter. It actually works. It's fun. It's gaming. It's all of those things. But you actually, at the later stages, are translating newspaper articles for CNN and BBC and all others. And that's the way you get it for free. Yeah, so it's thinking about how do we reuse without the bad kind of karma of you are doing something horrible for the planet. No, you're doing something exciting. Absolutely exciting. So I'll stop here.
there's uh, much more of where this came from. There's many more principles of how do we build our first ocean strategy. But before we go any further, I wanted to ask you questions, comments, reactions, puzzlements. I hope I leave you puzzled. That's, that was the plan. Yes. I guess when thinking about the collaborative consumption um, idea, mm -hmm. in the media or the news recently has been a lot around Airbnb and they're running into issues with paying hotel taxes or not. So I wonder if you could comment, is that just a, is that a roadblock that is just being put up to this either for good use or not good use or are, are we, is that kind of the traditional industry of hotels saying, we don't want you to overtake us and then putting up this roadblock or is it a legitimate thing that we need to work through in order for other collaborative consumption type of ideas to move forward? I would assume it's both. I was following also Uber's story. I'm a big right, fan of yeah. Uber. Any of you fans of Uber? So Uber is again sharing, um, in this case, drivers and not even their cars, really, their driving time. So um, if I think about the big protest that Paris staged and Berlin blocked it, when it comes to that extreme, when it's not constructive, I have to say this is an old industry that is really, really scared. But when it is done in terms of let's figure this out, this is a great thing, but let's figure it out, it's completely legitimate. So there has to be some sort of simple solution, including solution for tax paying. Um, I, I wouldn't see why would we make exception for this particular income generation as we don't do for anything else. So in that sense, it's usually both end for me. And I have no doubt that this will continue. We are running out of resources fast. Most of the products you, you don't even realize, copper, aluminum, that's not even 40 years, it's 20 to 25 years. And we keep building buildings as if copper will be there forever. Sorry, we are almost at the complete end. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is that, is that kind of the same story as like, we're gonna run out of gas as of four years ago? It is the same story in a sense of um, the hype. Um, you can say that we will find new geology, that we'll find new technology to take shale, to get oil out of sand, to get gas out of shale. Um, even if that is happening and we will find some new technologies, there's absolute guarantee we will. The actual tonnage of molecules on this planet will not magically grow. So it might extend us for a little bit, but the question that we're facing is not if, it's when. And when you're facing the question of not if, but when, we will have to transform to circular economy. Then it's a question, can I get on the bandwagon early and become ahead of the wave and capture the first mover advantage rather than being swallowed by that wave? And that's what I'm seeing with these companies, is they're definitely ready to be the first movers and protect themselves, rather than wait and see until it's too late and then be destroyed by the new world. The way Kodak was destroyed, the way Nokia was destroyed, the, the way so many companies you thought untouchable were destroyed. Yes? Do you see, especially with the sort of resource depletion, do you see the biggest driver of sort of, I guess, increased recycling initiatives do you see do you see recycling and the reuse of materials becoming something that is driven a lot more by the market seeing that you know there's sort of this impending wave that's going to crash over or is this a sort of you know one of the things where the market is just going to follow it until its end there'll be a really very large period of disruption and then they'll you know it, it'll correct itself mm -hmm. um I work in mining now, so I do have a group of companies that we own with my husband, but I agreed that for a few years I will help this poor company, uh, which is, I think, a very honest thing for me to do, to try to, before I kill the business, let's try to save the business, because I've been, you know, with a spear going after business for so long. So if I think about, for example, my company, um, it's a very simple and very honest world, and it makes sounds like an oxymoron again, yeah. honest business. Business is very simple. Business is speaking, and it's very honest. To business, there's a very simple binary language, plus or minus. That's it. When we're looking at the bottom line, plus or minus. That's it, it's a binary language, there's nothing complicated. It's not, well, let me see, it's not about not complicated. 
it's very simple, it's not easy. Those are two very different things. So business in that sense, it's very simple. Either we are doing something that is bringing my bottom line in plus, or we're doing something that is bringing our bottom line in minus. It doesn't care. It's not, yeah? So it's not against the world or for the world. It's a very simple language. So why are we doing recycling? Because it's cheaper. That's it. Plus or minus. Why we were not doing before? Because it was in minus. Today it's a plus, before it was a minus. Before it was taken away from my bottom line because it was more expensive for me to recycle than to buy new raw material. It's flipped around. That's it. There's no evil anything. It's a very simple, honest system. Now, why I say honest? Because the people who, like me, used to be running after business with Spear are the same people who are investors and demand that their pensions are growing. Yeah, I hope you are expecting pensions. How do you think pensions show up? It's a huge investment funds that manage your money and demand business to squeeze every penny out of their bottom line. Um, it's consumers. How many of you are in that 4% ready to buy extra? Yeah, pay extra for the green product. Most of us are not. We would like a cheaper, more exciting, better price. So it's the same society that demands to think about plus or minus. If we are demanding that, business thinks that way. This is a, we created the system. If we are not okay with the system, then we need to start recreating it. But today, the system that we created is very simple. Revenues minus cost equals profit. Very honest, very simple. To what extent, I mean, look, let's be honest. I mm -hmm. mean, the, the, the commodity boom over the last 15 years has been largely driven by China. Mm -hmm. As China rebalances to a consumption-based economy, we're already seeing the froth come off the commodity market, but they, because the lead time for developing assets, for mm -hmm. developing new commodities, mines, processing plants is so long, there's a huge overcapacity. So what mm -hmm. you're likely to have for, say, the next 10 years, is it actually an extended depressed period? So we may have run up 147% last mm -hmm. 10 years. We may be down 80% mm -hmm. for the next 15, mm -hmm. simply because Australia went and went crazy and built you know enough steel, you know enough iron ore mines to, to last for 40, 50 years just on their own, mm -hmm. right? At, at world supply, you know. Mm -hmm. And what I wonder is, I mean, I I, I like the overall approach mm -hmm. and all that, but. How does this work in a down, it, you know, I see how this works in, when oil's at $140 a barrel and gold's at $1,500 an ounce and copper's way up. How does it work when copper's way down? Mm -hmm. Very down. easily. It works in the realization that we are off the roller coaster. We don't want to play that game anymore. Mm -hmm. So once you, uh, the issue that we're facing with publicly traded company is that the tenure of a typical CEO is so short, the way a president tenure is four years. So you wouldn't see what happens after five cycles, up and down, up and down, up and down. But we're seeing more and more companies like ours that are saying we're not playing public game, we're getting off the market and we'll have the same CEO for 12 years. And once you've been a CEO for 12 years and you rode on that roller coaster, you don't want to depend on that anymore. You are like Saudis say, the Stone Age would not finish because we run out of stone. It will finish because we choose so. We choose to do so. Well, or another product comes along, right? What replaced the Stone Age was bronze. Sure. Right? It was a better, uh, a differentiated sure. product. Which is also an issue of what we're doing. So the previous options for energy, for example, are not good. If you think that the solar panels is the best thing ever, think about silicon. It's not a good solution. It's actually a horrible solution. So we are working with nano solar. Can we spray the solar panels on any surface without silicon padding it? As soon as that is coming commercialized, it will have to change the world. And then Tesla technology and many other things. So in that sense, yes, it is not um, visible this second in some industries, but the average of commodities is very rapidly changing because water prices are changing. And if you think about water embedded in everything we do, even if you take off all of the iron and minerals and so on, that alone can kill us. Let me test something. How many liters of oil have you used today? Oh, sorry. Liters of water have you used today? Gallons. Uh, sorry, I'm an American. Gallons. How many gallons of water have you used today? Probably over 10. Over 10 gallons. Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? 
You mean directly or indirectly through food or other? Whichever way you measure. Say about 50. About 50 gallons. Yeah, so that's 130 liters, 150 liters, yeah. Anybody else? 150 liters, that's a good bath. 30 gallons, that's a good. 50 gallons, that's a good bath. Anybody else? No guesses? The reality that you, on average, each day, are using somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000 liters, which is somewhere around 1,000 to 2,000 gallons. And let me explain what that means. So a typical, uh, a typical kilo of leather, for example, typical kilo of leather is 16,600 liters. So divided by three, about 5,000 something gallons. That's one kilo of leather. My shoes are one kilo of leather. So if I wore it 100 times in its life, every time I wear them is 166 liters or about 50 gallons. Just the shoes themselves. So just the water pricing alone will come to a place where we're crushing all of our pricing and our resource base. Except water is a classic case of a commodity that's unevenly distributed, mm -hmm. right? I yes. Mean, for example, a place like Vermont, whatever climate model you look at, Vermont's actually going to be in pretty good shape mm -hmm. at least vis-a-vis -vis water, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas, let's say you take Jordan or Bangladesh or, mm -hmm. you know, or the it's U.S. South, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the Southwest, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. a very different scenario. Absolutely. Absolutely, but business is a system that evens it out because you are a distribution system that takes resources from one place to deliver them to another. So even though it's unevenly distributed, we have enough methods, including violent methods. We see in Africa already quite a lot of things happening because of shortage of water. So we can easily see where an entire country will pick up and move to another country and say, we're environmental refugees, deal with it. Well, you're going to shoot us all. Well, and that analysis that suggests Syria Absolutely, absolutely. And Darfur's story was very much a drought-driven story. So absolutely it's happening already and absolutely it will have to readdress itself in the most ugly ways in some points and hopefully we will figure out a business out of it before it, we all decide to kill each other over water. That's my are hope. That, are you seeing that with the, the demand though from the consumer side? Like just when you're talking about like the mud jeans and mm -hmm. stuff. Consumers starting to demand, not even demand this, but to respond to sort of it's a different relationship to their products, right? Consumers, again, everything I see f in my own, we, we do produce jeans ourselves, so in my own business or in my big bunny business. It's very, very simple. Again, business is a very simple idea, is we exchange value. You cannot exchange value for loan as you don't trust each other and you don't speak simple language. Money is just a form of exchange, but it's a very, very, not easy, but very simple concept. So consumers respond to value. You stop producing value that matters to the consumers, you look cooked. And very, every time that the company run out of business, the Nokia and Kodak stories of our world is where they were so excited by their own product and service that they forgot that they need to actually produce value for the customers. Yeah, they're so attached to whatever they were attached to. And the customer value, it's a dynamic thing. It changes every day, so it changes. Uh, customers respond to value. And we have not seen, none of the stories I showed actually fail stories. All of them make good money. That means the customers look for common sense. If it's value and it's better price, overperforming, more beautifully designed, and has a reason, has a value that we're ready to buy, they're ready to buy, sure. Are we tired? Can I show you a last closing video about what's happening? So very often we'll look at uh, this kind of stories, the stories of overfished ocean strategy, and it feels like it's very, very far in the future. So I want to show you what's the future of overfished ocean strategy as a metaphor for all industries, not just for the one I will show you. How many of you heard of a story of phone blocks? Yeah, yeah? one or two? Good. So that's the story we will go for. And here's phone block for you. Can you see? throw away millions of electronic devices, which is they get old and worn out. But usually it's only one of the components that causes the problem. The rest of the device works fine, but it needs to throw away. Simply because electronic devices
thousands of knots of concentric glass. This makes electronic waste one of the fastest growing waste streams in the world. Just a second, I can see that something else is happening here. Both videos are playing simultaneously. I was wondering how to do it. I say there's, there's an opportunity for new music to go on these kind of videos. Electrical signals are transferred through the pins and two small screws lock everything in place. So if, for instance, your phone is getting a little slow, you can just upgrade the clock that affects the speed. Or if something breaks, you can easily replace it with a new one, or update it with the latest version. Another great thing about this is, you can customize your phone. So let's say this is your phone, and you do everything in the cloud. Why not replace your storage block for a bigger battery block? If you're like this guy and love to take pictures, why not upgrade your camera? Or if you don't care about any of this stuff, you can keep it simple and get a bigger speaker. You can choose the blocks you want, support the brands you like, or even develop your own blocks. Phone Blocks is built on an open platform where companies work together to create the best phone in the world. To set up this platform, we need to get the right companies and the right people involved. They will only get started if there is a lot of interest in a phone worth keeping. So this is the plan. To show them there is an interest for this phone, we need your voice. You can donate your social reach on the website. We gather as much people as possible. On the 29th of October, we send out the blast, all at the same time. Spreading all your voices to show the world there is a need for a phone worth keeping. The more people involved, the bigger the impact. Please visit phoneblocks.com to raise your voice and spread the word. So that was about a year ago, right? October 2013. This is the future. This is where we're going. So imagine that that's how we build cars. The reason, for example, why electric cars are not working very well, because we cannot charge them for three hours at the station, right? If we run out of juice. We cannot just go and charge the electricity for three hours. So the only reasonable solution for electric car is swap car, uh, swap batteries. Yeah, I come to a station, my battery is taken out, a new battery is come in. That means the platform for all cars should be the same because all the batteries should be the same. We never came to that, but the phone is beginning to come. Now, question for you, because I do want to show you the last video. How far into the future this is? So when do you think this product will hit the market? Next week. Next week? No, next year. Next year? It was a year ago that they posted it. Two to three years. Two to three years? Do you think it's realistic? No? There are few people who say no. There are few people who say yes. So here's where the project is right now. This is now called Project Ara because it was bought by another company.
lost power, but it's okay. You don't need yeah, power. It doesn't mean that. It's a whole thing. Let's So, I'm Daniel McCarthy. I head up design for Google's Advanced Technology and Projects Group. When we created this modular photo unit, and we realized that electro-permanent magnets would be able to keep it all together, and we realized we wouldn't have to cover it, we ended up deciding that embracing this block and modular aesthetic, it was part of the phone. Let's not hide it. Let's not put it behind the cover. Perhaps the best design statement we could make was that this phone can flow and adapt just as much as our lives flow and adapt. And that in itself is an aesthetic. So my name is Jeff Frank. I'm with 3D Systems. And so the 3D Systems Corporation is delivering the additive manufacturing 3D printing technology for the Art of Project. The challenge in all of these things are the material properties, making them robust and durable. We're just starting to head down the path of getting the necessary color and vibrancy. And one of the bigger challenges is doing all of this at the rate of being able to make you know, thousands of these enclosures uh, in a given day of production. My name is Eric Gunther. I'm co-founder of a company called SoSo Limited. We are working very closely with the ATAP team at Google to design the UI for the Aura Configurator app. It is an application that lets you browse through the world of Aura parts and to put them together and try them out in different phone configurations. Some of the people haven't even used a smartphone before, so we're really trying to make this interface as simple as possible and as kind of spatially intuitive as we can. And that's where the project is right now. It's coming very close to launch. And what you will notice immediately is how many people are working on that. This is the new trend. This kind of challenges we will have to do together. This is, has to be a collaborative platform of some sort. This is like an app system now in real world. So if before you could design your own app and sell it through App Store, now you will be able to design your own phone block and sell it through the open system. And that's the way we're going to produce cars, building and everything else. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Um, you can get much more on my website. I'm actually trying to get as much ideas out on the website with videos, all kind of articles, whatever is possible. So overfishedoceanstrategy.com is the easiest way to find it and you can get everything there for free. There's no reason to buy books or anything else. And you've been wonderful, so very nice to meet you.